Hello and good morning dear students and welcome to Baijiu's exam prep IS. Let us take a look at the various articles we have in line for today's Hindu news analysis. So in the detailed part which will be important for your mains exam we have two very important articles. One is related to the global debt. How there has been an increase in the global debt levels. Now what is global debt? what is global debt and what is India's share in the global debt, how India's debt entire picture looks like. We'll take a look over here. The second article is about the women's reservation bill that was passed by both the houses of the parliament on 21st September. So what are certain issues related to the bill? Why is women reservation required and are there certain drawbacks associated with it? In the prelims by its section, we have five articles. The first one is related to the ephemerals. What are ephemerals? We'll take a look. The next article is about IBSA group. That is India, Brazil and South Africa. Now yesterday in the news analysis we read that how the quad grouping, the foreign ministers of the quad grouping, they met at the fringes of the 78th General Assembly of United Nations. Now yesterday the foreign ministers of the IBSA grouping, they also met and they released a joint statement. The third article is regarding the Norman Borlaug Award. Now what is this award? Who was given this award this year? Why is it important? We will take a look in this particular section. The next one is about tourism in Kashmir. Kaubal Gali, Mushko Valley. It is opening up for the tourists after a very long time. What is the significance where these locations are and what are the various features of these places? The last article is regarding Nilgiri Thar. Now Tamil Nadu, it has proposed that there should be a census of the Nilgiri Thars under the project Nilgiri Thar that was announced by Tamil Nadu government last year in December. It wants the Kerala government to join hands for this census. Now what is Nilgiri Thar? What is the project Nilgiri Thar? That will be covered in the last article. So let us start with our first article. That there is a reason, there are certain reasons why there has been a rise in the global debt. Now the context is that a, a report was released by Institute of International Finance. Now this is a private institute, it is basically a collaboration of the various financial industries and certain professionals okay so a report was released by this institute of international finance according to which the global debt it has risen by 100 trillion dollars not million not billion trillion dollars 100 trillion dollars over the last decade that is in the past 10 years it is 307 trillion dollars now in the past decade it was somewhere around 200 trillion dollars as a share of GDP, global GDP, the debt is now 336%. For example, if global GDP is $100, the debt is $336, okay? So this is another important finding of this report. Also, this rise, this rise is being seen now after a consecutive decline in the global debt that was seen in the past seven quarters. Now, why was there a decline? We'll take a look in detail in the upcoming slides, but in short, the decline was majorly because of the pandemic, the COVID pandemic and the reduced economic activity all across the world. 80% of this rise that has been seen in the past decade, it has come from the advanced economies, including USA, UK, Japan and France. So it is mainly these four countries that have contributed to this excessive increase in the global debt. Amongst the developing world, three countries that is India, China and Brazil are responsible for this increase in global debt. 
So what do you understand by global debt? See, global debt, it means the debt of the government plus the debt by the private sector as well as households or individuals. When we add all these three, what we get is the global debt. All the governments of all the countries, all the private sectors, entities and all the households and individuals, all the debt taken by these, it is known as global debt. Now generally, why do governments borrow? Why does private sector borrow? Why do households borrow? Individuals and households, they usually borrow for their certain needs. For example, car loans, home loans, student loans, right? Why do governments borrow? Now, governments also have certain expenditures that they have to cater to. What is the revenue, major revenue sources for the government? It is mainly the taxes. In India, it is dividends from PSUs, disinvestment and other things and other very minor sources of revenues. Major is what? Direct and indirect taxes. Now, sometimes what happens, these revenue, this revenue of the government, it is not enough to fulfill its expenditure needs. Most of the government, especially in the developing world, they follow what? Deficit kind of a budget. That means their expenditure usually is always higher compared to their revenue. So, what do these governments do? They take debt from the international markets, from the various international banks like World Bank, Asian Development Bank, IMF and so on. They take these, they take this debt or they borrow this money from outside when they are unable to meet their expenditure because of the limited revenues that they have. So that is one reason to fulfill their expenditure needs. The second reason is that, for example, India had taken a loan of $1 billion from World Bank. Okay, it was five years ago. Now what happens is that there is an interest that the country has to pay on any of the loans that they take, right? Now India does not have any excess money in order to pay this loan, the principal amount of the loan as well as the interest. So what can we do? We can take another loan from say Asian Development Bank. We can take this loan and use this money to pay back the previous loan. So this is another reason why governments borrow. To pay interest on the money that they have already borrowed. Now, with regards to private sector, the private sector, it usually borrows in order to invest. Invest in, say, machinery, in labor, and other, other things in order to build their businesses. Okay? So, households, governments, and private sector, we know the intention behind why they are borrowing. Now, why are we seeing this rise in the global debt? See, debt levels generally over time, they increase, they rise. Why? Because the total money supply, it steadily rises over the years. Now, the central banks usually, in most of the countries, the central banks, they are responsible for providing money in the economy. Now, they have to ensure that enough amount of money, enough amount of liquidity is available in the market in a controlled manner so that everyone has money, but the inflation levels, they are not very high. So, this is their role. So, every year, they keep on releasing more and more money into the market. And this is known as what? This is known as monetary expansion. So this is one reason why debt usually increases. There is monetary expansion. The central banks, they are providing, ensuring that steady and controlled supply of money is available in the economy so that people, they have the money for to fulfill their needs. So what happens is that because there is money in the market, because money is available, for example, there's a bank, 
it has money available. So what will bank do? It will start giving out loans. It will give out loans to the private sector, to the households and even sometimes to the government. Okay. So whenever there is money in the market, the debt will increase. Also, even a simple increase, a simple rise in the amount of savings, be it household savings or government savings or any other savings. If I'm saving, if I'm putting some money in the bank, again, bank has some liquidity, avail liquidity available with it. So what will the bank do? It will again start giving out loans. So one, because of the monetary expansionary policies of the central banks and second, because of even a slight increase in the savings of the economy, both of these can lead to what? Increase in the debt levels of the economy. This is very normal. This is nothing peculiar. However, what is peculiar in the current scenario? See. Usually what happens as the interest rates rise, it becomes more and more expensive to take the loan. If I have taken a loan of 1 lakh rupees and I have to pay an interest of 10% compared to if I have to pay an interest of 20%, I would prefer to take the loan when I had to take the when I had to pay the interest of 10% and not when I have to pay it for 20%, right? Because it will be more expensive for me now. So usually what happens when interest rates increase, the amount of loans that are given out or people take or governments take, it should reduce. However, right now what is happening, there is a lot of inflation in various economies across the world. Because of which, the central banks of these countries, they are increasing the interest rates. Now, despite this increase in the interest rate, we have now seen that there is an increase in debt. So, this is a pe peculiarity that debt levels are increasing despite an increase in the interest rates. Now, as I stated, in the past seven quarters, there was a decline that was seen in the debt, the global debt rates. For the past decade, the report said in the past decade, there was an increase of $100 trillion. However, in the past seven quarters, there was a decline in the amount of debt. What is the reason for that? First reason, as I stated earlier as well, there was a reduction in the global economic activity. The private sector was not taking loans much. People, they were not interested in taking loans. Governments were also taking minimal loans just in order to support the people. So there was a reduced economic activity due to the pandemic as well as the lockdowns. Also, there is another thing that was going on inflating away of debt by the governments. What is this? Inflating away of debts. So governments, if they have a lot of loan over them, how can they pay it back? Either by ensuring that their revenues increase or they can do another thing. They can ask the central bank to print the currency and use that excess currency to pay off their debts. Now what can that cause? You know that printing of extra money by the central bank can cause what? Inflation. So now even though the government has paid off its debt, but there will be an inflation in the economy because there is an excess amount of liquidity in the economy now. So basically, government, in order to pay off its debt, it is causing what? It is causing an extra burden on the consumers, on the citizens, on the businesses. So this entire process, printing money to pay off debts, is known as inflating away of debt. Why the word inflation? Because it causes an inflation in the economy. So basically the consumers, they are facing the burden of the debt of the governments. So this has also again led to what? An increase in inflation 
in the economies and that has not deterred that even that inflation has led to what an increase in interest rates by the central bank but that has not deterred the various agencies in taking loan because especially the government agencies they are sure that they can get away with it so what are the concerns related to these high amount of loans one is debt sustainability see if i take loan of 10 lakh rupees but my income, I am not able to grow it accordingly. Then what will happen? Eventually, I will either have to take another loan to pay back this loan with interest or I will be defaulting on the loan, right? So that means my debt is not sustainable. I will not be able to pay back the money that I borrowed from the market. So this is debt sustainability. So debt sustainability is the biggest question. Till when can we follow the cycle of taking newer loans to pay back the old loans? After a while, what will happen? There will be defaulting. And that will lead to what? An economic crisis. Also, central banks across the world, they have been increasing the levels of interest rates, as we stated earlier, which is in order to fight the inflation. Even the Monetary Policy Committee, they have a limit of 4% plus minus 2% of inflation, based on which they decide whether they need to increase or reduce the interest rates. If the inflation is high, they need to do what? they need to increase the interest rate in order to pull out the liquidity from the market. So central banks are doing that. Despite that, the debt is increasing. So what will happen? The debt is increasing. The interest rate is high. So eventually, the governments or the private sector, whoever is taking the loan, they'll have to give away a higher amount of money. So this will increase the pressure on both the governments as well as the private sector. And again, it can lead to what? A default in the loans or it can lead to what? Inflating away of debt, which again will cause a burden on the consumers. The rising private debt is also a very big cause of concern because this is doing what? This is creating unsustainable booms which are in layman terms known as bubbles. Like the bubble of housing market that was seen in USA in the early 2000s that led to the 2008 crisis. So these are bubbles. The businesses, they keep on unsustainably increasing themselves, but eventually these, this increase in their business, it is not backed by any physical, either gold or any physical asset. So what will happen? Eventually this bubble will burst. What you are seeing in case of NFTs these days. NFTs, they were very famous in the past year. People were paying millions of dollars to buy these NFTs. But the value of these NFTs now is just one or two or even lesser lesser dollars right so nfts was also a bubble so similar kind of bubbles they can be created by giving out excessive loans by the private to the private sector and it can lead to another economic crisis just like we saw in the year 2008 now what about india what is india's status with regards to debt its entire debt and its public debt. See, the World Economic Forum, it warned at the start of this year regarding the rising public debt all across the world. They said that public debt is bound to increase because of certain reasons. What are the reasons? First, after the pandemic, all the governments want their economies to revive and that is why they will provide fiscal stimulus to the various businesses. That includes certain subsidies, cheaper loans and so on. So for that, the governments, they will have to borrow. Second, there will be a rise in the interest rates. 
in order to manage inflation. Now as the interest rate rises, what will happen? Your debt will also rise. If earlier I had to pay back 10 lakh plus 10% interest, what is that? Let us talk about simple interest now. So 10 lakh plus 10% interest means I have to pay back 11 lakh. Now the interest rate has changed to 20%. So now my debt has also increased to 12 lakh. Right? In very basic simple interest terms. So because of rise in interest rate, what will happen? The debt, the amount of debt that you have, it will also increase even if you are not taking any new loans. So World Economic Forum had already warned about that. Now India's total debt to GDP ratio, it is what? 170%. If you see over here, at a global scale, it is 336%. So India's GDP, debt to GDP ratio, it is quite low. Now this figure has been taken from economic survey. Out of this, 36% is households, is the share of the households. 88% is the share of non-financial private entities. And 82% is the share of the government. At a global level also, this is very less. Because at global average of household share in the debt, in the debt market, it is 62%. India's is only 36%. For these, the global share is 160%. For India, it is quite less. When it comes to public debt, according to economic survey, it was 82%. However, recent data in March that was released in March 2023, according to that data, our public debt is 84%, which is very less compared to many other economies like USA, for which it is 264%. For UK, it's 257%. For France, it is 345%. And for Japan, you'll be surprised to hear, for Japan, it is 426%. Right? For every 100 rupees of its GDP or 100 yen of its GDP, it has a debt of 426 yen. With regards to a comparable economy, say like China, for India, it's 84%. For China, it is 295%. So that is quite high. So this is basically the total debt we are talking about and not the public debt. For public debt, India's public debt, it is very much in the sustainable category. It is only 84%. It is high, yes, but it is sustainable as long as our economy, it continues to grow. According to the latest data, of Q1 of financial year 24, our growth rate was 7.8% in real terms and 8% in nominal terms. So that means our GDP is growing. That means the government revenues will also grow and eventually that might help in easing out our public debt. However, it must be ensured that this money that the government is getting because of the increase in the GDP, it should not be doled out in non-productive debts, in non-productive sectors like for giving out freebies. Okay, so this is about this particular topic which was talking about how the public, how the global debt it has been increasing at at a very high rate for the past decade. We talked about the various reasons why generally the debt increases. It is a very normal phenomenon. However, there was a decline that was seen in the past seven quarters, which was due to a decline in the economic activity, as well as the tendency of the governments to inflate away their debts. Then we talked about the Indian scenario, how India's debt is, very, is high, but in sustainable category and it will continue being sustainable as long as we do not keep spending money on non-productive debts. Now we come to the second topic which is about the women reservation bill. 
The Parliament has passed the 128th Constitutional Amendment Act, which is also known as Nari Shakti Vandan Adhi Niyam, also the Women's Reservation Bill. Now, it is a Constitutional Amendment Act, that means it is making certain changes to the Constitution. What are the changes? It has added Article 330A to provide reservation, 33% reservation to women in the Parliament. 332A to provide 33% reservation to women in the state legislative assemblies. It has amended, amended 239AA in order to provide 33% reservation in Delhi legislative assembly. And it has also added Article 334A which states that this reservation will continue for 15 years and after that duration or just before that duration ends, the parliament can review the entire decision and they can take a final decision on whether or not it needs to be extended. So currently, the at present, there are 82 women MPs in Lok Sabha. Because of this reservation, this number will increase to 181. This will also help in increasing the membership of women in the state legislative assembly where it is less than 10 percent in 20 states now please note that this reservation will apply to seats reserved for scs and sts so for example 100 seats are reserved for scs and sts in, for sc category in a particular state legislature out of these 33 will be reserved for sc women same for STs as well. However, some issues have been raised regarding the bill. The first issue is that the implementation of this bill, it is linked to the delimitation exercise. Now, there is an article 82 in the Indian constitution. According to which the parliament after every census needs to pass a delimitation act which will lead to formation of a delimitation commission, which will again delimit the various constituencies of India on the basis of the latest available census. However, in the year 2002, Article 82, it was amended to freeze any further delimitation until the figures of the census, the new census, comes after 2026. That means... 2031 census. So unless we get the data of 2031 census, there would not be any delimitation exercises according to this amendment. So what does that mean? That there is a possible delay in the implementation of the Women Reservation Bill. It might be delayed until 2031 census. After the census, there will be passage of the act. After that, there will be creation of the commission. After which, there will be delimitation of the constituencies. And post that, it will be decided which seats will belong to women. Okay. So, there might be a huge delay in implementation of this bill. However, however the government has stated, our home minister he has stated that once the general elections of 2024 end, there will be a census exercise and a delimitation exercise so that there is no delay in the implementation of this act. The second concern related to this act is that while it has been explicitly stated that there will be separate women quota within the SC, scheduled caste and the scheduled tribe quotas, Nothing has been mentioned regarding the OBC quota. There has not been a provision in the bill regarding providing a separate quota within quota for women with regards to OBC category. So that is another concern related to the bill. Now quickly a brief history of the women reservation bill. The story started in the pre-independence times. In 1931, 
women leaders, major women leaders, they came together and provided a memorandum to the British India government that there should be equal rights for men and women. Adult franchisee, it should be adopted without any kind of sex discrimination. Based on that, India, after its independence, it adopted universal adult franchisee. So, any citizen of India greater than 18 years, they, were, they are allowed to vote regardless of their caste, creed, gender or any other issue. Okay? In 1955, the government of India, it appointed a committee which recommended that there should be 10% reservation for women in the Lok Sabha as well as in the state assemblies. It did not talk about the Rajya Sabha. It only talked about the Lok Sabha and the assemblies. However, this was not implemented. In 1988, another commission that was created by the government the national, gave the national perspective plan for women. Now this plan, it also was recommending what? A 30% reservation for women to increase their participation in the political activities and decision making of the government. This again was not accepted. In 1993, there came a very landmark decision by the government of India. The parliament, it passed the 73rd and 74th Constitutional Amendment Act which provided for 33% reservation for women in the local bodies. Eventually, many states, almost 20 states of India, they have increased it to 50%. The first state to do that was Bihar in the year 2006. After that, 19 other states have already adopted that. So there is 50% reservation for women in the local bodies, both urban as well as rural. In 1996, the Women Reservation Bill, 81st Constitutional Amendment Act, it was introduced in the Lok Sabha, which again called for 30% reservation in Lok Sabha and the state assemblies. Okay. So, it was basically following the National Perspective Plan for Women, which also recommended 30% reservation. However, the bill elapsed as it was pending in the Lok Sabha while the government fell. Later, later in 1998 again, similar bill was introduced, but it again lapsed due to the fall of the government. After that, it was introduced multiple times in 1999, 2000, 2002 and 2003, but again, there was no success. In March 2010, on March 9th, 2010, a bill was again introduced and it was passed also in the Rajya Sabha for women reservation. What was it providing? It was providing a 33% reservation for women in the parliament and the state legislatures. It stated that these seats, they will be provided to the women on a rotational basis. Rotational basis means if there are 9 seats, out of these, these 3 are called for women, are reserved for women. In the next assembly election, it might be these 3. There will be continuous rotation of the seats that are reserved for women. Also, this provision, it will lapse in 15 years. However, because the Lok Sabha got dissolved, this bill again got lapsed. Then in September 2023, the government of India again introduced this bill and it was historically passed by both the Lok Sabha as well as the Raj Sabha Currently, it is pending the assent of the President of India. Now, what are certain arguments that support the bill? Why was this bill required? First, the Global Gender Gap Report of 2022, it stated that India is 48th amongst 
146 countries in terms of political participation. When it comes to the parliament, only 14% of the sitting MPs, they are women. Now this figure, it is much lower compared to certain neighboring states like Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka and Pakistan. Also, approximately there are 40% voters, 48% voters which are women. However, only 14% of representatives are women in the parliament. In the state legislative assemblies, as I stated earlier, in 20 states, it is less than 10%. At a total level, only 9% of the sitting MLAs, they are women. So compared to the number of women voters, women representatives, they are very less. Also the political parties, they are not very active in contesting in allowing women to contest the elections from their tickets. It was evident during the 2019 Lok Sabha election when less than 9% of the fielded members, they were women. Less than 9% fielded were women. However, 14%, sorry, uh, approximately 11% that one were women. 14% is for entire parliament. Also, it has been seen previously that after the 73rd and 74th Amendment Act, women who got a chance to show their leadership, to get represented, to get the representative status at the local governments, they have done some exemplary work in their field. There have been many studies that are done at the panchayat level regarding how women representatives, they are working. And it was found out that women representatives, compared to the males, they are more sensitive to the needs of the women. Okay. So, they are more sensitive to the needs of women. They understand better the problems of the women. And if there is a women representative in that area, there is a higher chance that the other women, they are more participative in the policy making process. They are more vocal regarding their problems. They are more vocal regarding what all needs to be included in any policy. Okay. So one woman representative, it is empowering the entire women population in that region. So that is one very important thing. However, there are certain arguments that are put against this bill. What are the arguments? See, many believe that this will benefit only a certain section of women. These, this section of women will be basically those who are already privileged. Basically the rich, the urban women who have certain amount of political backing, only they will get benefit from this particular reservation bill. The second argument is that it might repeat the phenomenon of Sarpanchpati at a national and state level. What is the phenomenon of Sarpanchpati? So if a man was a Sarpanch in the previous election and suddenly that seat has become reserved for women. So what will they do? They will ask their wife to stand for them as a proxy. The wife will win the election. But the entire decision making power will be in the hand of that man. The wife will be just a proxy. Okay. So this is related to what the patriarchal setup of the Indian society. That the man is the one who has to take the decisions. Okay. So this phenomena has been seen at the panchayat level, even at the level of urban local bodies. And it is... People are afraid that this might start happening at a national and state level. However, if we start empowering our women, we start empowering and giving trainings to the women representatives, this might, this phenomena might reduce. Another argument is that it is the duty of the political parties to give tickets to the women. 
it should not be duty of the national government the political party should have taken the initiative to give adequate amount of tickets to the women representatives because unless they stand for the seat how will people go and vote for them how will they reach the parliament how will they reach the legislative assembly so the owners should have been on the political parties and not the parliament of india to provide women reservation so these are the arguments against this phenomena we have studied the arguments that support the bill we have studied the various changes that the bill has brought to the constitution as well now we come to the prelim bite section the first topic in the prelim bite section is regarding the ephemerals so there was this news article about maharashtra's ephemerals how certain people certain researchers from iucn they are studying international union for conservation of nature its sub body species survival commission how they are studying the ephemerals of maharashtra now this term ephemeral it becomes important for your prelim prelims for your environment and ecology section so what are ephemerals ephemerals they are short lived plants that grow only during favorable periods and they lie dormant either as seeds or roots or bulbs during the unfavorable time for example there is a plant which grows only when there is moisture so what will happen this plant will grow during the rainy season once the rain has ended what will happen the grown plant it will release certain seeds now these seeds they will lie on the ground and eventually when there is rain once again the plant will grow once again so these are known as annual ephemerals which release the seeds which can be used for growth of the similar plant in the next season so it is not the same plant that is growing its generations are growing because this plant is dead its seeds are alive and seeds have given rise to this so this is the first generation this is the second generation then there is one type that is perennial eph ephemerals in case of perennial ephemerals what happens there is a bulb or a tube like potatoes a tuber so it is there and during the favorable condition it grows the leaves and the stems now the condition has become unfavorable so the leaves and the stems will die out however this bulb or the tube it will stay under the ground once the favorable conditions they reappear it will once again grow its leaves and the roots so this is perennial ephemeral so there are two types of ephemerals one annual one perennial in annual the next generation grows in the next season in the perennial the same plant it keeps on growing one after the other season now monsoon ephemerals what are monsoon ephemerals they are those which bloom because of the monsoon season because of the availability of moisture now these plants they bloom towards the end of may and throughout june july august and september they start from may some of these they may start blooming from say july but usually they start from may and their cycle it ends around september when the monsoon season it also comes to an end examples are orchids lilies wild yams which are also known as suran indian squill pond weeds lantern flowers and so on so these are certain examples that are endemic to this region maharashtra western ghat region the next topic is about the ibsa meeting now ibsa is what india brazil and south africa now on the sidelines of the united nations general assembly 78th session the ipsa foreign ministers which included our external affairs minister shri s j shankar they all met together and they released a joint statement 
what did the joint statement say first there will be a stand alone meeting now this meeting was on the fringes of another major meeting right we'll have a stand alone meeting only of for the purpose of meeting of ibsa people of the foreign ministers in the first quarter of 2024 these countries they also reaffirmed the stance of supporting and advancing the interest of the global south now these three countries they are the biggest representatives of the global south that is the developing world and that is why they need to keep supporting and advancing the will of the global south they have also released the statement regarding peaceful peaceful resolution of conflicts without any mention of ukraine or russia or any other country with regards to un reforms there was a lot that they had to say they expressed their frustration with the paralysis of the negotiations regarding the reforms in the united nations security council they have been calling for the reforms for many years for decades now but no progress has been made on that so they will together they will together ask the general assembly to, for a written decision and to fix the timelines regarding the united nations security council reforms regarding the expansion of both the permanent as well as the temporary membership of the united nations security council they also agreed to push for adoption of comprehensive convention on international terrorism that has been pending for long at united nations because all the three countries they understand the problems that are related to terrorism the threat that it can pose to the developmental aspirations of any country also these countries together reaffirmed now please hear very carefully they reaffirmed the sole authority of the united nations security council for imposing any kind of sanctions on any country now right now russia is facing sanctions by the western world by usa countries of european union right this is not sanctioned by united nations security council it has not been sanctioned by them right so this these countries ibsa countries they are also part of what brics russia is a part of brics so ibsa countries they have come together released a statement to reaffirm that only united nation security council should have the sole authority to have any sanctions any against any country so indirectly we are supporting russia against the sanctions by the western world they also call for reform of the multilateral developmental banks like world bank and international monetary fund to make them more sensitive to the needs of the developing world to increase the role of the developing world with regards to decision making in these multilateral banks also they together regretted that how the developed world it has not met the climate finance goal of 100 billion per year by the year 2020 now quickly a little bit about ipsa now ipsa it was formalized and named ipsa dialogue forum in the year 2003 when the foreign ministers of these three countries they met in brasilia and issued the brasilia declaration in brazil now the presidency of this group it is rotational and currently brazil is the president of the group up until now five leadership summits they have been held for this group however please note that the last summit was held more than a decade ago in 2011 so since then no summit has been held and that can show that this grouping it is not very strong 
these countries they also have committed to a ibsa fund which is also known as ibsa facility for poverty and hunger alleviation now these three countries all the member countries they know the problems related to poverty and hunger in fact brazil had made long strides in order to reduce the poverty and hunger in the country and that had made it a global example a global success story so ibsa facility of poverty and hunger Ele elevation it was established in march 2004 became functional by 2006 it is supporting various developing countries in order to reduce poverty and hunger it has supported up until now 35 developmental programs across 31 countries there was also ibsa fellowship program that was launched in november 2016 to allow the exchange of young researchers or young fellows so it allowed for it promoted academic exchange of young fellows in fields of economics and social studies so they can learn from each other now another reason why this meeting is very significant is because G20 India was the president the current president right the troika included what indonesia that is the pra past president india that was the current president and brazil that was the upcoming president now for the next summit what is there india is the past president brazil will be the present president and the future president will be south africa so these three countries they will also be the troika of g20 next year so their collaboration becomes even more essential next we have the norman borlaug award now norman borlaug award what is it who has been given this award for the year 2023 now there is an agricultural scientist known as swati nayak who has received this award for 2023 she is only the third agricultural scientist of india to receive this award why did she get it because she and her team they developed a strategy to promote the use of a drought resistant variety of rice which revolutionized the rain fed agricultural regions in the state of odisha what was this rice it was shahabagi dhan rice it is a native variety of odisha and the this agricultural scientist who is also a part of ed indian indian rice research institute in delhi she has helped or formulated a strategy for this purpose now a little bit about the norman borlaug award it is also known as the nobel prize in food and agriculture informally it is known as that not a formal uh, definition it is presented every year in the month of october in october you also know that nobel prizes they are given right so this prize is also given in the month of october by the world food prize foundation why what who all can be given this award it recognizes exceptional science based achievements in international agriculture and food production exceptional and scientific achievements in agriculture and food production industry by individuals who are under the age of 40 years the winners they are chosen by an anonymous international jury so this is about this prize it is 10000 dollar prize and it has been given to an agricultural scientist swati nayak for this year next we have the kaubal gali mushko valley and gures valley now these regions they have now been opened up for the tourist and it is expected that around 50000 tourists they will enter this they will go and visit this region for this year now what are these regions first we have kaubal gali kaubal gali is a mountain pass 
at a height of 4166.9 meters. Now this mountain pass, it is very much essential because it connects the Gurez Valley with the Mushko Valley. Now Mushko Valley, it is located in the Dras sector of Kargil which again is located in the Ladakh Union Territory. And this was the site of the 1999 Kargil War. It has lush meadows, rich biodiversity, lush meadows with wild tulips and exquisite views of the glaciers, making them very popular, very attractive tourist destinations. They are also home to endangered Himalayan view. Now, Gorez Valley, it is located in the Union Territory of Kashmir in a district known as the Bandipura district or Bandipur district here. So, Gorez Valley was up until now closed for civilians. Why? Because there was huge amount of activity, shelling of this region from across the border. However, the ceasefire between India and Pakistan, it has been working for the past 43 months now. And that is why a decision has been taken to allow tourists to go over this location. Now, one very interesting thing about Gores Valley is that there is no intrusion of concrete buildings in this region up until now. There are only log houses and log infrastructure that is available here, which again adds to its touristic value. It is also home to certain animal species like ibex, like the musk deer, the famous musk deer of Kashmir and the marmots. The next topic is about the Nilgiri Tahar. Now Nilgiri Tahar, it is this. It is a goat it is a ungulate. What is ungulate? A hooved animal. It is the South India's only mountain ungulate. And according to the IUCN Red Book, it is endangered. So that is why it becomes essential to conserve this animal. Now it is endemic to Western Ghats in the Southern Hill region. Its habitat, it ranges between the Nilgiris in the north and the Kanyakumari hills in the south. So it moves around in this location itself. Now this habitat, it has been facing a variety of pressures. One, because of the humans, we are increasing our, we are encroaching into their habitat for a creating our settlements for our agricultural purposes. We are cutting down the forest to create some other infrastructure and so on. The second reason for the decline in the habitat is invasive species. Now these habitats where these Nilgiri Tahars live, they are basically what? Grasslands. Okay. So these are grasslands and it is on this grass that they feed upon. Now what is happening in these regions, there is certain invasive species of tall trees like pines, eucalyptus and wattles and also some other grasses. So what is happening, these grasslands, they are getting converted into woodlands and that is affecting the availability of habitat for the Nilgiri Tahar. Now this animal, please note, it is the state animal of Tamil Nadu. And that is why to understand and to emphasize on the importance of this animal, Tamil Nadu government, it launched the Nilgiri Thar project, Project Nilgiri Thar, on the lines of Project Tiger, Project Elephant and Project Hangul and so on in December 2022 in order to increase their efforts for the conservation of this endangered species. They also declared that October 7 every year will be called the Nilgiri Tahar Day. Now component of the project Nilgiri Tahar includes research on the possible reasons why these Tahars, they are getting the lumpy skin diseases. So this 
particular component of the project. It will research on why they are getting this disease and provide possible solutions so that their populations do not further decline. Now, Tamil Nadu, according to this news article, it has proposed that a census should be done for the Nilgiri Tahars in order to identify what their population is and accordingly conservation efforts they can be undertaken. Now this census that is proposed by Tamil Nadu government it will take place in two phases. In the first phase which will be held in November after the southwest monsoon. So this will be the first phase which will be undertaken by the government of Tamil Nadu. In the second phase, they require the assistance from the government of Kerala. The second phase, it will be undertaken between March to April after the calving season has undertaken. That means after the calves, they have been the new calves, they have been born. In order to identify whether or not there was an increase in the population of the newborns or not. So many new technologies like camera traps, like drones, they will be used for this particular census. Okay. So that was the last article. Now we come to the mains practice question. First, what do you understand by global debt? Here you need to tell it includes government, private as well as individual debt. Why has it seen a rise in the past few months? Okay. Why has it, in, has it seen a rise? You can state that generally it sees a rise. It is a very general phenomenon. However, before that, there was a decline which was due to certain reasons. Unless the concerns related to a rise in the global debt. So concerns they have also been covered during our discussion. How it can lead to unsustainable debts. Which can lead to either defaulting or it can lead to what? Inflation, inflating away of the debts. The private sector they can also enter this bubble which once burst can lead to economic crisis. The second question is women's reservation bill will help improve women's political participation. Now please note it is talking about political participation and not just political representation. Political representation means that there will be more representatives, more women representatives. So that is definitely the basic goal of this entire bill to increase the representation to 33% but it is also talking about political participation. Women like who are not the representatives they will also get interested in the politics. So we have seen through studies that this is happening right. Also women they will get certain role models to look up to and that will inspire them to become even more active in politics. So you have to tell whether or not you agree. You can give the, depending upon what your opinion is, you can give the arguments in favor or against. So this is 10 marks and 150 words. So with that, we come to an end to today's session. Do not forget to head to our Telegram channel to attempt the quiz that has been prepared on this session. The link for the Telegram channel is available in the video description. So thank you very much. I hope you were able to understand everything and have a very good day ahead.